All right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we're going to continue uh, looking at our new sutra. Uh, this is going to be part four of our five-part series on the Upali Paripricha Sutra, otherwise known as the Questions of Upali. Um, yeah, and just to kind of a quick, quick recap. So this sutra that we've been talking about now for a couple of weeks is also called the definitive Vinaya or Vinaya Vinaya, the definitive discipline. And the idea of this sutra is that this is kind of a Mahayana Buddhist sutra that is dealing with the idea of discipline, of precepts, morality, ethics, but in the Mahayana. And one of the things that I can say from the very beginning, from the chapters, or not chapters, but from the sections that we've already looked at, the basic idea is that for early Buddhism, like the early monastic renunciatory path, like that style of Buddhism, that style of Buddhism, it is a one size fits all type of practice. And what I mean by that is, is that the rules for monastics are the rules for monastics. And it doesn't matter what kind of... It doesn't matter who you are in that way. The rules are the rules, and it's about obeying these rules. This sutra, though, coming from the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, is more about the Bodhisattva path, and the Bodhisattva path being based upon this teaching of upaya, or skillful means. What that means is, is that it's not a one-size-fits-all teaching. It's actually different depending upon your who you are, what you're after, and all of that. So the Buddha has been explaining how there's sort of kind of two different vinyas. A discipline or a vinya for shravakas, voice hearers, which is the term for a monastic. And then there's the vinya, the, the discipline for bodhisattvas. And what we've been learning about is that how the two are not the same, that they have sort of different goals, and therefore they have different means in that sense. Now, the one thing before we kind of get back into the sutra, the one thing that I kind of want to make clear is that this sutra called also the questions of Upali, this of course comes from the fact that there's a monk named Upali, who's considered like the best monk. He's like, he knows all the rules, he follows all the rules. And so Upali stands up, this happened uh, last week, that Upali gets up and says, hey, I have some questions for the Buddha about the Vinaya, the Vinaya, as it pertains to Shravakas and Bodhisattvas. And we don't really need to get too into that, like what happened last week. But the one thing that I want to make clear is that, and yeah, because it's going to happen again tonight. The way that I read these sutras, many of you already know this, especially if you've been coming to Dharma doors, but I read the Mahayana Buddhist sutras. I, of course, read them allegorically. And what that means is, is that I do not, I do not take Mahayana Buddhist sutras to be historical accounts or to be accounts of historical events. Mahayana Buddhist sutras are stories. They're very narrative. They're very story-like. And so in that way, it's advisable, I would advise someone reading this sutra to not assume that this is a record of a historical event in which the monk Upali asked the Buddha about 
Bodhisattva discipline. In this sutra, Upali represents early Buddhist monastic discipline. Like that's what he fully embodies. And so to read this allegorically, it's to have a representation of early Buddhism stand up and ask the Buddha, what's the Vinaya, Vinaya like for the Mahayana? So then in answer to Upali's question, the, 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 the Buddha gives a few different answers to the differences between the two types of discipline. But ultimately, he kind of comes to this conclusion, if you will. And actually, it's not a conclusion, but it's, I want to remind everybody of this. It's about how in the Shravaka Vinaya, in the, in the monastic discipline, the rules are the rules, and if you break them, you break them. And there's consequences, karmically speaking, for breaking the rules, period. But what we've learned from this sutra is that if you're on the bodhisattva path, it's a much greater transgression of the discipline if your transgression is at coming out of hatred. Whereas if your transgression is coming out of desire, it's not as much of an offense. And ultimately, what the Buddha said, which is really interesting, is that it's this idea that for someone, a bodhisattva, to transgress or commit an offense out of desire, the Buddha says, well, you know, desires everywhere. Desires what is what it keeps samsara going. So desire is sort of par for the course of samsara. And so if you break a transgression out of desire, it's understandable. It's still a transgression, but it's understandable. Whereas if a bodhisattva breaks a transgression out of anger, what the Buddha said is that this is a much greater offense for a bodhisattva because when we commit transgressions out of anger, we push all sentient beings away. And that was the, the Buddha's idea as he was saying that, so when we are acting out of anger, we are pushing everybody away. And that's entirely against the Bodhisattva vow, the vow to compassionately bring all sentient beings to awakening. That's like what we're in the business of as Bodhisattvas. If we're a Shravaka, if we're a monk or a nun, then we're just interested in our own morality and our own moral discipline. And so the rules are the rules in that sense. So the basic idea of the sutra so far is that for the bodhisattva, the discipline, the vinaya is a little tricky. And the way the Buddha put it last week is that the shravaka discipline is entirely prohibitive. Whereas the bodhisattva dis discipline is partially prohibitive, partially permissible. So it has this kind of uh, a little more room, a little more flexibility to it in that way. Now, there was one other idea that has come up so far that I need to remind you of so we can dive back into where we were. This sutra in talking about the bodhisattva path earlier on kind of actually this might have even been during the first session the sutra makes a distinction between a super beginner bodhisattva a bodhisattva that's sort of a little more advanced and then a bodhisattva who has attained the patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena, this sort of like really high level bodhisattva. So the sutra, even within the bodhisattva path, started making distinctions between what beginners should be doing versus what more advanced practitioners should be doing 
versus the ultra advanced practitioner. And this distinction is about to come back into play because after, so I'm diving back into the sutra. If you have the big yellow book, I'm on page 270. So this is after the Buddha, and actually Upali is still right here, but the Buddha has finished answering Upali's question. And then from among the assembly, Manju Shri, prince of the Dharma, asked the Buddha, and actually I can't even give you the quote yet because we got we to gotta talk about who Manju Shri is. So Manjushri is, of course, an advanced bodhisattva. And this is why I wanted to introduce or I wanted to remind everybody about my kind of allegorical way of reading the sutra. Because if you understand that, and you understand that Upali represents the early Buddhist monastic discipline, then you understand that Manjushri represents Pranya, that transcendent wisdom, that deep, deep wisdom of emptiness, that's Manjushri. So when Manjushri steps up from the assembly to ask the Buddha a question, there's a way in which we should all be like, oh, whoa, like what's Manjushri about to say? So his 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 presence, his presence heralds great dharma to come right so manjushri steps up after all of this discussion of the real vinaya the real discipline manjushri steps up and says world honored one all dharmas are ultimately vinaya why are regulations even necessary And I'm going to give you the Buddha's answer, and then we're going to talk about it. The Buddha answered Manjushri, if ordinary people knew that all dharmas are ultimately Vinaya, the Buddha would not teach them regulations. But because they don't know that, the Buddha gradually teaches them the rules to enlighten them. So this is, pro this is profound already. But again, I wanted to remind you that we were sort of, we dealt with beginner bodhisattva stuff. We dealt with kind of more me meteor, middle ground bodhisattva stuff. And now we're getting to the advanced stuff. So what's Manjushri's question? Well, this is where we need to do a little bit of language work. So Manjushri says this thing and he says, since all dharmas, since sarva dharma are atyantika vinya, since all dharmas are ultimately in the end vinya, why, why bother teaching? Why are there regulations necessary? So up until this point, I've been just kind of going with a certain flow. And what that is, is that the word vinaya, vinaya gets translated a lot of different ways. It gets translated as discipline. It gets translated as rules, morality, regulations. But you, we actually, and the, the vinaya is also a body of literature. So it's a, it's a body of records of all of the monastic teachings. That's called the Vinaya. So there's actually kind of a, a complex of ideas around this term Vinaya. It can refer to the actual literature. It can refer to the rules that are in the literature. Or it can refer to the obeying of the rules found in the literature. But Ultimately, in order to understand where Manjushri is coming from, we need to understand what Vinaya actually means. So Vinaya means 
restraint. It means, it can mean like tamed, like if you have like a, a wild animal and then you tame it, that is vinia. The, the idea of it being controlled, regulated, that's the idea of vinia. And so what we kind of need to understand at a kind of an ultimate level is that the Dharma, Buddhism, is talking about most of us are out of control. Most of us are out of control. Uh, we just are kind of conditioned and reactionary and we're grasping and we're clinging and we're suffering and we're crying and we're just out of control. And Buddhism is about getting under control, or at least early Buddhism is articulated and explained as self-discipline, self-control. So the idea of Vinaya is about this kind of restraint, or again, a restriction, or this taming. So we want to be understanding that there's a there's a, a progression in Buddhism moving from a state of being mentally out of control. And that can be that can be anything from being like just distractible, like where you're just like, whoa, whoa, what was that? What was that? Or it can be like really out of control, like out there stealing and lying and killing and being violent, like being really out of control. So Buddhism is about vinaya, taming or controlling, and then bringing this into restraint or into a state of control. So that's this, the deeper meaning behind vinaya. So when Manjushri says, wait a minute, Buddha, aren't all dharmas already ultimately vinaya? He's not saying, aren't all dharmas already the rules? No. He's saying, aren't all dharmas already under control? Aren't they already tamed? And that's when the Buddha says, well, yeah, if ordinary people knew that, then I wouldn't have to teach them the regulations. But it's because they don't know that, sorry, it's because they don't know that that I got to teach the regulations. So what does Manjushri mean by this idea that aren't all dharmas already tamed? So the basic idea of this, and this is of course a tricky one, but we're about to get into a whole bunch of tricky ideas. So, you know, ultimately where Manjushri is coming from is from that enlightened perspective of emptiness, of all phenomena, of all dharmas, lacking svabhava, lacking inherent existence. I want to remind you really quickly, because if, if we don't have this firmly in mind now, it's going to be tricky the rest of this evening. So I want to remind you that when we talk about a phenomena not having an inherent existence and therefore being empty, which is Manjushri's kind of perspective. Let's work with this one. So I want to just work with this, this one for just for a second. So the idea here is, is that, and the way that I always present this, if you've never seen me work with this optical illusion before, the first thing is I want to make as, as far as this is as an as an upaya, as a as an example, we need to forget uh, that this is like an optical illusion. So the way that I initially kind of present this is, it's the idea that you hear a knock at the door, and actually the way that the way that I like to present this is that there's two people, and there's a knock at the door, and so. We both go up to the door and look through the peephole 
and we see this. Now, the way that I kind of like to present this example is one of us looks through the peephole, sees this, and gets all excited. And it's like, ooh, we should open the door. The other person sees this and goes, no, uh, let, let's not, let's not open the door. Let's just pretend like we're not here. <laughs> now, why did one person have a positive? reaction to what was seen and the other person had a negative reaction to what was seen well the one person the first person saw a wine glass and they love to drink <laughs> they love champagne or whatever it is and so when they looked through the, the window and they saw a goblet what they think is like a champagne or a wine glass they get all excited and they're like yeah let's open the door Let's let the champagne in. But our other person saw two people. And our other person has slight like social anxiety and therefore was like, nah, let's just keep the door closed. Let's just keep it me and you because <laughs> I don't want the two people to come in. So now we have two different people two different reactions, one positive and one negative. But why did they have two different reactions? Because they perceived two different things. So as far as this example goes, again, I want to make it clear that if this were a real example, like a real world situation, the one person would be like, wow, why, why don't you want to, why don't you want to open the door? And this person's like, well, I ha I'm a little like socially awkward. And they're like, yeah, and drinking helps with that. Like you should, you, we should open the door. And this is when they start to confer. And the one person's like, what people, what glass of wine? <laughs> I didn't see what you saw. So then they both go up to the door and they listen. And one person hears, and the other person hears, and this person says, yeah, don't you hear them whispering? And this person says, that's not whispering. That's the bubbles. That's the bubbles of the champagne. That's the ever effervescence of the champagne that I hear because I saw a glass of champagne. So now the auditory perception is different, but the visual perception was different. So what we want to understand, and I'm just going to, I'm going to cut this short and I want to just say, make it real simple. Let's just say for the, just for the sake of this example, let's just say that let's say the person who saw the faces, let's say the person who saw the two faces convinces the other person that they saw it wrong. And finally, the person who saw the champagne glass, they take one more look and they, they see the people. And they're like, oh, you're right. I had it all wrong. It was actually two people. What we want to talk about is the wine or champagne glass. Where did the champagne glass go? Oh, that's right. It never was. The person was wrong in a kind of delusional in that sense. They thought they saw a wine glass, but they were in a way just perceiving what they thought they saw in that way. In other words, the wine glass, champagne glass, or actually, let me put this much more accurately. When this person looked through the peephole, and they saw 
the wine glass. The idea is, is that that doesn't have any svabhava. It doesn't have any inherent existence as a wine glass. In fact, it has so little inherent existence as a wine glass that as soon as the person realized it, that it was two people, there just wasn't a wine glass anymore. It was actually that empty that it wasn't. But what about when the person thought they were seeing a wine glass? What about then? Did it exist then? And when I say exist, I do not mean exist as an idea in that person's mind. I mean like literally, tangibly, physically existent for all eyes to see. Is there really a wine glass out there for all eyes to see? No. So the idea is, is that that person's perception of the wine glass was a delusion or an illusion, like a mirage, like something in a dream, ultimately empty. And that is revealed when the person finally sees the two faces. But what we, of course, need to understand is that everything I just said about the wine glass goes for the perception of two people as well. Just because this person convinced that person to come over to their side of perception and to see the two people, these two people, meaning the two viewers, they are now in agreement. Yes, I too see two people like you do. And now these two people have a false sense of security in their belief in those faces because they have confirmation from another delusional imaginary or imaginating person in that way. So emptiness or things not having svabhava is about both the glass and the two faces. No matter what it is, it's empty without svabhava. Everybody doing okay with that example? Now, just in case anybody was confused still though, let's forget about this optical illusion and let me, let me remind you about this one from, this was either last week or the week before. Oh, there's a knock at the door. Let's go see what it is. And we all look through the peephole and we see this. What is it? One of us might be seeing a roll of toilet paper, but I'm over here always seeing my fancy scarf. And so my point about this is that it's not an optical illusion. Perception is real. And the idea is, is that you might perceive a roll of toilet paper and think that it is inherently, absolutely, a roll of toilet paper for all eyes to see and agree upon. But these eyes perceive a very thin, delicate scarf. So I'm over here thinking it's a scarf. You're over here thinking it's a roll of toilet paper. I could convince you to come over to my side and put on the scarf, or you could convince me to come over to your side and use the roll of toilet paper. But both of us if we think it is really a roll of toilet paper or a scarf or whatever, if we are locked on, attached to the perception that it is this or that, we are attached to a delusion in that way. So Manjushri is coming from that perspective that all dharmas have no fixed Bhava, they have no svabhava, are therefore empty and are ultimately like all of these optical illusions or whatever I've been showing you. So Manjushri's position is that any dharma that you perceive is ultimately empty already. So what could be out of control? 
what could move from a state of being out of control to a state of being in control, meaning vinya. Manjushri's perspective is, is that there isn't any dharma that is out of control because there's no dharma that ultimately fundamentally exists. And therefore there can be no, or from his position, what he's saying is, is that they are all ultimately already tamed because they are all ultimately already ceased. That's going to be the Buddhist language, that they are already in cessation in that sense. Manjushri is going to elaborate further, by the way, but I just wanted to lay out some preliminary you know, ideas there. Everybody doing okay with the quick crash course in emptiness? <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Okay. By the way, a couple of things. This amazing line. When I first read this, frankly, I was blown away. This line where he, the Buddha says, yeah, if everybody knew <laughs> that, that all dharmas are already tame, yeah, then I wouldn't have to go with all these rules and regulations. But because they don't know that, we got to do all the rules and regulations. I think it might have been last week or the week before, but whatever. I kind of was emphasizing one, one of these sessions. I was emphasizing that for me, for Dharma doors, I don't talk a lot about morality and moral discipline, like all the rules and the precepts and vows and all of that, because I'm with Manju Shri. I'm with the Buddha in that way. And I do think that if you really, really understand these deeper teachings of emptiness and dependent origination and all of that, observing of the rules follows naturally. I really do like believe that, understand that. And so I too am like very on board with this idea that if everybody already understood the deepest Dharma teaching here, all the other stuff would follow. So, okay. So after that quick exchange, very quick exchange between Manjushri and the Buddha, Upali steps up, the Shravaka. Upali says to the Buddha, world honored one, the Tathagata, the Buddha, has discoursed on the definitive vinaya. But Manjushri has not said anything on the subject. May the world honored one command Manjushri to explain it briefly. So again, I'm like Manjushri. I don't really, I have never really mentioned the precepts. So Upali's like, hey, Manjushri never talks about the precepts. Manjushri never talks about discipline. And the Buddha says, the Buddha tells Manjushri, now you should expound the subtle meaning of the ultimate vinaya. Upali will be happy to hear about it. So Manjushri, the Dharma prince, said to Upali, all dharmas, are ultimately quiescent when the mind is quiescent. This is called the ultimate vinaya. So Manjushri is about to give a series of these, a, a series of these sort of pithy definitions of the vinaya. And so I want to go through them because the it's kind of like a, an elaborate vocabulary lesson in these like deeper ideas. So each of these is going to evoke a different idea. And the first one is the idea that all dharmas are ultimately what the translators here translate as quiescent. So really quickly, really quickly, about nirvana. So the first thing you need to know is that there's a the the language of 
quiescent. If you ever hear that language in Buddhism or like in a Buddhist text or a sutra and it's talking about quiescent, that's co it's not even code, but it is synonymous with nirvana. So in other words, Manjushri is saying all dharmas are ultimately nirvana or nirvanic to, to kind of make a hybrid term there. When the mind is nirvanic. So a really, just a quick word about the idea of nirvana. So something to think about, about nirvana. So I want you, one of the things that, that's very tricky about nirvana is, especially in the Mahayana tradition, when thinking about nirvana as being synonymous with quiescent, what we should be thinking about is it's a lot like it's a lot like something that didn't happen yesterday. So if you think about something that didn't occur yesterday, like it never happened, it didn't ever actually exist. Nirvana's like that. And what I want you to th think about or just feel is I want you to be thinking or notice. I want you to notice how you emotionally feel or emotionally respond to something that never happened. Does it like bother you? Are you excited about it? Are you like worked? Are you like, whoa, that thing didn't happen yesterday? Or when you think about something that just never occurred, does it have this utterly quiescent feel to it? This utter, utter stillness, utter quiet. There's no motion in an event that didn't occur or an object that never manifested. It is, it is so still and quiet and peaceful in that sense. If you put your mind on that which has never come into existence. Again, nirvana is a lot like that. A lot like that, meaning that which has never come into existence. If now that I've said that, what I could possibly then kind of get you to see is how it is that the realization of no self, and in fact, realizing that that self that I thought I was has never actually come into existence. In other words, that is in nirvana already. That's how a deep penetrating understanding of no self propels you right into a state of nirvana. Whereas this stubborn belief in me, and we're going we're gonna to have a reason to talk more about this idea of self in a second, so don't worry. But this stubborn idea of the belief in me is what is keeping me out of nirvana. You actually don't have to do anything in a way to get into nirvana. You have to stop doing something in a sense. So now that we know that quiescent is sort of a synonymous term for nirvana or nirvanic, Manjushri is saying all dharmas are ultimately nirvanic when the mind is nirvanic. And this is called the ultimate vinaya. So now all we have to do then is 
understand how the mind is quiescent in that way. And that, of course, is, is a tricky one. But I, I assure you that what is to come is meant to bring us to an understanding of that. So unless there's any questions, I'm going to move to the next. Cool. In addition, Manjushri says, no dharma is found to have a self-entity when the mind is not defiled or attached. This is called the vinya of no regret or no remorse. No regret. So this isn't about all dharmas being quiescent. This is about all dharmas not having self-identity. It's the language they use. Self-entity. In other words, Atman is the kind of normal term for this idea. It could also be Pudgala, Pudgala. But there's another meaning or idea about the idea of all dharmas not having a self-entity. Now, we are not talking about what I was just talking about a second ago, which is the teaching of anatman, of no self. That's not what's being referenced here. What's being referenced here is actually something a, 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 even deeper than that. And what it is, is it's about, it's about this idea of an individual thing. You know, just one thing. I always like to show you this thing. So the idea here is, is that we have a word, you probably have a word for this, and you might call it a clock. But as I always point out, this is actually, whoop, that was the battery. This is actually a bunch of things. Well, knobs, buttons, there's electronics. It's a bunch of stuff. And yet, with the stroke of a word, the mind can just wrap all this into just one singular entity. Is this one singular entity? No. That would be the self-entity of this, like that it is just one thing called a clock. But wait, there's more. So somewhere, all right, here it is. So a moment ago, this used to be part of this. <laughs> like before I opened it up and spilled its guts everywhere, right? This used to be one with the clock, it, it, right? It was part of that singular entity, the clock. And what I want to then demonstrate is that I just mentioned that the singular entity clock is actually made up of a bunch of smaller parts. One of those parts would be this battery. But this teaching of the no entity, no self entity of any Dharma, it goes for this one too. Is this just one thing? There's the casing, there's the battery acid, there's the copper part, the black part, there's the writing. So is this just one thing? No. And if I were to open this up and spill the battery acid out, would the battery acid be one thing? Again, with the stroke of a word, it, we could the mind could hold it as one thing and call it the battery acid. But then of course, a chemist would come along and be like, that's not one thing, that's a bunch of molecules or what have you. But then of course, is a molecule one thing? Is an atom one thing? 
is an electron one thing? Ultimately, in Buddhism, the reification of any individual entity is an illusion. Guess what? I'll bring it back to the real basic Dharma teachings. Oh, look. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, a bunch of parts. But with the stroke of a word called me, called Michael, it is held as one singular entity, just like a clock. And the teaching, the deep teaching about all of this, about the emptiness of all phenomena, which is what we're talking about, the real teaching about this is to not then throw all these things away as being, quote, non-existent. They are not existent, but what we, what we don't want to do is be like, oh, that's right, whoop, <laughs> no clock. Rather, we want to be aware that our mind is singularizing that which is not singular. The mind is singularizing that which is not singular. And then as I look out at all these faces, I could singularize each of you because you have your name. But the wisdom here is about understanding what the mind is doing in there. And then not clinging in that way. But again, we don't want to just throw everything away and say, oh, it's all empty. It doesn't exist. We actually want to be with that which doesn't exist in that way and understand why and how we are perceiving it as a singularity when it is not. So that being said, perhaps we now have a deeper understanding of Manjushri when he says, no dharma is found to have a self-entity when the mind is not defiled or attached. That's called the vinya of no regret. And by the way, and just a little language thing, no regret in Sanskrit is Ashoka. And there's a famous Indian emperor, like the first major emperor of India, whose name was Ashoka, the emperor with no regret. Just a language thing. Okay, so any questions about the quiescent nature of all dharmas or the lacking of self-entity of all dharmas? Yeah, no. I have a small question, I think. What, why is it called no regret? Why is the emptiness of all dharmas called no regret? Good question. Good question. I, I have thought about it. I suppose one of the ways to think about that gnome is to take a moment and reflect upon the nature of regret and then you ask yourself, is there any place for regret, given what we just have talked about? <laughs> mm -hmm. When all dharmas, in this sense, are kind of non-existent in that way, and even the very self that would be regretful has been shown to be non-existent in that way. Whereas if we have regret, we are reifying and being attached to a whole plethora mm -hmm. of dharmas. I sort of have a bigger question about I've been waiting with it, but I'll, I'll just put it out there and feel free to put it off. Okay. Um, back to the question of why, if everyone saw all dharmas as empty, although I don't think that was the word he was using, then the Buddha wouldn't need the Vinaya or the Vinaya. What? I, I guess... Uh, maybe it's not a question, maybe it's a comment like, it 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 seems to me that the the there's a there's a like a circular thing going on there like observing restraint develops our ability to understand to develop wisdom you know if we have sufficient wisdom maybe we don't need restraint but i don't have that wisdom yet you know mm -hmm. and so it 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's just something that I keep thinking about from the very beginning of this of this today's mm -hmm. episode that uh, there's this uh, kind of interesting relationship between the restraint that the Buddha asks us all to have, among other things, in order that we can develop the wisdom mm -hmm. versus having the wisdom. And then that, you know, gives we then we can conclude on our own or then there's no need to have restraint because it doesn't arise something like that yeah so really quickly no i mean you, it's a really important question you're asking um let me put it to you this way let's go back to really quickly let's go back to this example i just want to walk us through something really quickly so because what it what it's about is I'm, I, so my dream, and I, I will never be able to do this, so I always just have to describe it in your mind, but I would love if I could create an optical illusion like this, but where, and this is where I just have to make up a story, but I would love to make an optical illusion where these Two faces reminded you of your parents. And the glass, my the 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 um the story that I have in my mind is that in your childhood home, there was like grandma's uh you know chalice. And this particular shape reminded you of grandma's chalice that was always up on the shelf that as a kid you kind of always sort of it was magical to you so whether these look like your parents or this looks like that sacred grandma's chalice the reason why i would love to have an optical illusion where not only did it look like faces but it looked like your parents is so that we could actually walk through the realm of desire which would be the emotional reaction you have to your parents, which is different than any reaction I would have because I don't know your parents. So either I wouldn't see those people, or even if I saw what you saw, I wouldn't have the same emotional reaction that you were having. Same goes with if you see the sacred chalice, there would be a, a, that, that childlike wonder at it. And that's all realm of desire. Of course, as we've spoken about in the past, right underneath the realm of desire is just the realm of form, which is that these look like they're in the form of people, or this looks like it's in the form of a goblet, but no particular goblet. And then, of course, there's the realm of space, which is that in order to see any of that, you need a little bit of space. Either this is space and it allows you to see this, or this is space and it allows you to see the two faces. So there's all three realms. Again, the realm of desire, if this reminds you of your parents and you get triggered, the realm of form, if you're just seeing what looks like faces, and then the realm of space, when you understand that it's neither form nor not form in that way. Now, the reason why I quickly walked us through that is because being out of control, being untamed, is about that kind of getting triggered, getting emotionally worked up about things, especially if those things are illusions in that way. So what the Buddha is saying is, is that if everybody actually could see this emptiness stuff, you wouldn't be attached to things. You wouldn't be emotionally triggered and anxious and this and that about things. So that's, Noam, how I understand why the Buddha says, yes, if people understood the emptiness thing, they wouldn't have the problem of being out of control. Yeah? Cool. All right. Shall we do another? Because Manjushri's got a bunch. Ah, this is an important one. They're, they're all important, but the next up is 
all dharmas are pure by nature when the mind is not confused. This is called the supreme vinaya or supreme vinaya. So if you have the big yellow book, I do want to inform you there's an important, uh, a very important uh, translation issue problem here. So this says, or Manjushri says, all dharmas are pure by nature when the mind is not confused. And then in brackets, they have confused by wrong views. But I want you to know that actually there's a really technical term that's being used here. And it's about uh, all dharmas are pure when the mind is not inverted. Vipalasa or viparaya in Sanskrit. So there's this teaching in early Buddhism, in the Pali tradition called Vipalasa, and in the Mahayana tradition in Sanskrit called Viparaya, which means inverted. And there are traditionally four inversions. Mistaking that which is impure for being pure. That is one of the inversions. Uh, mistaking joy for suffering, mistaking beauty for ugliness, or mistaking ugliness for beauty, and mistaking no self-entity to have a self-entity. So those are the four inversions, and we've actually then already dealt with the idea of the self-entity. This one is dealing with the idea of pure and impure. Now, what Manjushri has said is that as a matter of fact, all dharmas are pure by nature when the mind is not inverted. In the early Buddhist tradition that talks about the inversions, in early Buddhism, there is impure dharmas and pure dharmas. There's wholesome activities and unwholesome activities. And the problem is that we've got it twisted, we've got it inverted, and we mistake unpure, impure dharmas for being the pure ones. But my point is, is that in early Buddhism, they're very kind of dualistic. It's actually one of the things that the Mahayana has a problem with, is how polarized and dualistic early Buddhism is, especially along the lines of purity, impurity. It's a, it's a very puritanical tradition, the early Buddhist one. But in the early Buddhist one, it was about getting these two confused and then wanting to be more clear about what is a pure dharma and being clear about what is an impure dharma. In the Mahayana tradition, Manjushri is articulating this teaching, which is that all dharmas are pure by nature, all of them are pure by nature when the mind is not inverted. So when the mind is not inverted, it's not about, oh, we've got which is which figured out. When the mind is not inverted, we realize that all dharmas are pure by nature. And this ultimately goes back to the idea of all dharmas already, already being in a state of nirvana of all dharmas ultimately not having the self-entity that we think they do, and therefore they're kind of like mirages to begin with. It's from that position that the Mahayana tradition says all dharmas are fundamentally pure by nature. And it's only the discriminatory mind that goes around putting things into categories of useful, not useful, beneficial, harmful, this and that. So that's that teaching. And really quickly, I want to kind of drop an idea on you that goes along with this. Let me see. Yeah, I'll do it here, but it's going to set us up for the next one. So what I kind of want to mention and it's, it's not so much about pure, about pure and impure, but I want to make a, a clarifying statement about all dharmas. 
like this, this idea that they keep talking about. All dharmas are quiescent. All dharmas are without self-entity. All dharmas. The question is, all of them? <laughs> like every single one of them? And I want to address that. It'll help, I think, clarify. If, it, if it's confused at all, then it'll help clarify. I, I don't always like to use this example, but I will tonight because it, it'll just make things easier. I don't always like to use, I certainly actually don't like to use sort of pop, pop culture references too much and definitely sort of not usually movies and stuff. But every now and then a good matrix analogy is very helpful. So I have to presume everybody has seen this movie, The Matrix, and understands the general premise of our hero, Neo, being trapped in this computer-generated reality called The Matrix, right? So the thing about that analogy of the idea of the Matrix world, what I want you to kind of be thinking about from the perspective of that film and from the, the premise of that whole world that they've created, I want you to be thinking about Neo being in the matrix in what he thinks is the world, but it's actually not the world. I want you to think about how statements about phenomena in the matrix it goes for all the phenomena in the matrix. There's nothing in the matrix that is not the matrix. It's not like there's some real thing that has snuck into the matrix world. And so my, what my point is, the reason why this is a helpful analogy, it's about understanding that if you were Neo at the beginning of the film, not knowing, that you're in the matrix, then you might walk down the street saying, oh yeah, those are beautiful, those are ugly, that's useful, that's harmful, that's this, that's that. And it would make sense for Neo to walk down the street dividing all the dharmas into this category and that category. But once he is awakened to the nature of the matrix, does it make any sense to put things on this side of the street and that side of the street? They're all matrix. <laughs> no, nothing is any more or less matrixy in that way. That analogy, I think, is a useful analogy to understand why it is the Buddhists keep talking or Manjushri keeps talking about all dharmas. Because they're talking about the all mind-made reality matrix in that sense. And there's nothing that isn't of that mind-made reality matrix, even your very idea of yourself in that way. So that's sort of, now, of course, within the realm of that movie, The Matrix, I guess all dharmas are impure because they're all ultimately false and there's a kind of reality to get to. That's where I don't like using the Matrix movie, the Matrix movie as an analogy. Because there's this idea of being out of the Matrix. In Buddhism, there's actually not really being out of the Matrix. You're either in it and understand it, or you're in it and fooled by it and suffering. So to get out of it is to sort of overstand it if you will, not understand it, overstand it in that sense. So an important distinction to make between that kind of Plato's cave analogy where you could actually get out of the cave versus a deeper phenomenological description of the way perception is working. So questions, comments, answers, ideas. Excellent. So with that in mind, meaning my matrix analogy real quick, Manjushri also tells us that 
all dharmas are suchness, are suchness itself, when the mind is devoid of all views. This is called the pure vinaya. Right, so you might have noticed each of these vinayas is getting a different adjective, like supreme vinaya, ultimate vinaya, pure vinaya. So there's all of that. And this one is saying that because all dharmas are suchness itself, are tathata itself, when the mind is devoid of all views, and then that's called the pure vinaya. So this is a these, this is a tricky one because the idea of suchness is tricky, and the idea of drishti or views is tricky. Put the two together, and it gets really tricky. So let's begin with the idea of views first. Actually, so we talk a lot about views um, in Dharma doors. It's like a kind of a, a key idea. The word for a view is, of course, a disti, a drishti, a very hard word to pronounce. But it's this idea of like you know, what we in English call a worldview, a political view, a religious view. We use this language in English. We talk about having a view, a point of view. And when we use that word in English, a point of view, when we use the word view that way, we don't mean with the eyes. We mean holding an opinion having an opinion in that way. Well, interestingly, in Sanskrit, the word drishti, it literally means a gaze or a view. But just like in English, it has this connotation of an, an, of an opinion or a position, a worldview. And the tricky thing about Buddhism is its relationship to views. Because the idea is, is that, you know, a view is, and, and a drishti is deep. It's not just a political view or even a religious view. A drishti is a deep seated understanding of what's going on here. And what I mean is, is that you may think that the world was created by God and God's watching over us and I got to be good because God's watching. And if I am good, I get to go up to heaven and be with God for the rest of my life. That's a view. That's a view about life and like what's going on here. But if you were to say, Eh, it's just a bunch, it's a big chemical, biochemical, electrical reaction going on, very scientifically minded. It's just a bunch of atoms, particles, and molecules bouncing around that over time have gotten more and more complex and gotten together in more and more complex configurations until the point that the dirt was aware of itself in such complex configurations. But those complex configurations that are aware of themselves just eventually fall apart and become food for other complex organisms. That's a view. <laughs> so my point is, is that it doesn't matter if you have a quote, religious view, a scientific view, or what if you said it's unknowable? The meaning of life is unknowable. That's another view. <laughs> so, I wanted to you know, spell it out this way so that you could then begin to ask yourself, okay, then what isn't a view? And that's exactly the point is that all of us basically have a view, even again, even if that view is, I don't know, that that's a view as well. Buddhism is so tricky because ultimately they are suggesting that you do not attach to and become, a, a, um, you don't cling to and become attached to any view. 
even Buddhism, even this idea that you shouldn't get attached to a view, you should be suspicious of that as well. That's to practice the Dharma, as I understand it. And what that means is, is that you don't get to cling to this belief in God. You could entertain that idea, but as soon as you get attached to it, as in, I know what is going on. Uh, that's <laughs> immediately you reveal you don't know what's going on in that attachment. And so again, you know, there's a, a really famous early Buddhist sutra. Uh, it's actually number one in the Diga Nikaya, the, the Brahmajala Sutra, Brahma's net, also sometimes translated as what Buddhism is not. That is a great sutra because in that sutra, the Buddha lists out 62 different worldviews along the lines of what I just suggested. Uh, the worldview that it's all about reincarnation, the worldview that you go to heaven or hell, the worldview that you just become food for plants. The Buddha articulates all of these competing 62 views. And then when asked, like, well, what's your view? No, no, that's why what I'm, this is the, the Buddha says, and that's why what I'm teaching is not what all those other people are teaching, whether they are religious people, scientific people, philosoph uh, you know, philosophers, nihilists. I'm teaching something totally different, he says. And ultimately, just to let you know, all of these other worldviews, no matter what kind of worldview, they all presume the existent self. And then it's a statement about whether that you, the existent self, go to heaven, go to hell, you just fall apart, you, 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 whatever. And Buddhism has just already taken the you out of it. So where's the view? That's the, the idea of, of um, being without a view. What, Nagar, or what Manjushri says here about the mind being devoid of all views. Now let's go to suchness. So what he says is, is that all dharmas are tathata itself when the mind is devoid of all views. And this is called the pure vinya. So about suchness, really quickly, I want to go back to our working example of our faces and our goblet. The idea of suchness, it has a lot to do with this. It has, there's a couple of component parts to the idea of suchness. One idea, it has to do with, remember when I first introduced the two faces and the goblet, and I set it up as there was one person who saw the goblet, and another person that saw the two faces. So in that scenario, so this is before the one person convinced the other person to come over to their side. This is when we are still in like a debate. Is it a glass or is it two people? Which is it? So in normal reality, like what passes for normal reality? If there were a situation where two people heard a knock at the door and they both went up and looked through the people and saw two different things, we, or what passes for normal reality is a world in which we can determine who's right and who's wrong. What I mean is, the idea is, is that we can open up the door and get to the bottom of this. <laughs> we can get to the bottom of whether it is really two people or whether it's really a glass. Or we could open the door and realize both people were wrong. 
That's possible too. But my point is, is that by opening the door, there's an idea that we could get to the bottom of this and figure out what it really is. Is it really a glass or is it really two people? And then once we figure that out, we can then figure out who was, quote, right and who was wrong. And I'm introducing the language of right and wrong because this has to do with about views. So the idea of suchness, a starting point for understanding suchness, suchness has to do with this person is experiencing a glass in front of them. <laughs> and there's a way in which that is such, that is so. This person is experiencing, is perceiving these two faces. And that is such, it is so. The point, my point is, is that it's, it's a lot like somebody who's hallucinating. Everybody else around them is like, uh, we, we are not seeing what you're, you're describing like an elephant in the room or something, and we don't see this elephant. Therefore, you're wrong, and we are right. From the position of suchness, it's not right or wrong. There is no such thing as right or wrong. There is what is being experienced, what is such, what is so. So the first kind of quality about suchness is it's about what is such and what is so without any appeal to quote unquote what is really going on. What is really going on is you think you're seeing a glass. <laughs> that is actually what's going on. That is so, that is such. All of this debate about who's right and who's wrong, that's not suchness. Because suchness respects people's experiences for being so, for being such. And there's no position to say you're wrong. <laughs> How could I be wrong about my, like, how could my, like, if I'm, if I take a bunch of acid and I'm like hallucinating all of these like multicolored balloons everywhere, how could that be wrong? And I'm not, I'm not advocating taking hallucinogens that say, but what my point is, is that how could that hallucinatory, hallucinatory experience be right or wrong? It doesn't even make any sense. It's just, it is so, it is such. So that is sort of one nature of suchness. Really quickly, there's an, another really important aspect to suchness. Suchness, to understand suchness, to experience suchness, within suchness, there is no arising, something abiding, and something ceasing. In early Buddhism, there's this idea that things don't exist. And then I get together and make something, and therefore it exists. And then I tear it apart, and now it doesn't exist. That's like normal reality, or again, what passes for normal reality is the idea that things don't exist, but then they come into a state of existence, exist for a while, and then go out of existence, right? Well, you know, the best teaching of suchness, or at least this idea of what is what could be called birthlessness, not the non-arising of things, a really, really good example of this and the Buddha uses it, I use it all the time. It's this, this fist. So if you have never, if you haven't seen this one before, this is like a classic Buddhist magic trick. So, oh, and if you haven't seen 
my magic trick, I'll show you the full Buddhist magic trick. So you see the fist? Pay very, very, very close attention to the fist. All right? You watching? Ta-da! Where'd the fist go? Is it in my pocket? Where'd it go? Oh, look, it's back. Oh, wait, where'd it go? Oh, it's back. <laughs> so the, a fist is an excellent example in that way of a dharma that is birthless and deathless or ceaseless in that way. And what I mean is, is that when I do this, when I go, and then I ask you, where did the fist go? What we need to be thinking about is the fact that the physical constituent elements of the fist, they're all still right here. But where's the fist? Oh, there it is. The point is, is that if something sort of existed, then the idea of it coming into existence, abiding and then going out of existence, that would make sense in a way. But here we have this fist, but I can't figure out where the fist comes from. And I can't figure out where it goes. Whoa, like, where is it? And of course, this is a great example because we instantly realize, oh, that's right. A fist isn't a thing. A fist is an idea. It's a concept. And when the conditions are appropriate, a conditioned mind out there can go, oh, that's a fist. But is it inherently, fundamentally a fist? The point is, is that things that are like made and created, they do not flash in and out of existence. But you'll notice that this fist is flashing in and out of existence. And what that does is that it reveals that it is not an inherently existent dharma. So rather than the fist arising and abiding and then ceasing, what we can say is, it is such, it is so. It is so, it is such that you are seeing a fist in that way. So another element about suchness, like, if, if you want to, like, if you're asking the question, like, am I in suchness? <laughs> am, am I experiencing suchness now? Well, if you're thinking in terms of past, present, and future, and the idea of things coming in and out of existence like that, you're not in suchness. But if there is this sense of immediacy, of, like, kind of total presence in a way with things or all things are seen as like a fist, a provisional designation, but not an inherently existent thing that has come into existence or is in threat of going out of existence. That's suchness. So it's kind of, again, a tricky topic, the idea of tathata, of suchness. But those are a couple of the qualities of it in that way. Questions, comments, answers, or ideas about suchness and or views and their relationship. I tried to do that in a way that would make a relationship between having a view and things that views are predicated upon and how this teaching of either emptiness or suchness sort of, it does away with things that could then build up an, a view in that sense. Questions, comments, answers, ideas. Yeah, Maria. 
So there's something about this um, hallucination analogy that kind of bugs me. So like um, there's a hallucination say of an orange and then an orange that we can eat. Is the orange that we can eat just a more convincing hallucination? Like, is its solidity just another lakshana or another characteristic um, that's just sort of more, a little longer lasting and that is, again, more convincing in the way that we interact with it of its realness? Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can. Yeah, so it's it's really about so if I go and now this is totally it's almost end it's almost ceased it's almost non-existent but my point is so rather than an orange we'll talk about this you could use this as toilet paper is this inherently toilet paper if you are seeing a roll like oh michael's got a roll of toilet paper in his hand you're hallucinating because you're not seeing my scarf so again from this perspective we are all having our own unique little hallucination based upon our oatmeal and coffee in the morning rather than having lsd and ecstasy or whatever it is but my point is, is that this teaching, it's why I use the roll of toilet paper, because we all see the roll of toilet paper, but we could get lulled into this false sense that it is actually a roll of toilet paper for everybody. And that's the same as a hallucination. In, in that way, in that they don't have any svabhava, either of them. Yeah. All right. So we didn't get all the way through Manjushri's amazing exposition of all of this. So we'll pick back up on that next time. Um, yeah. And then that'll conclude uh, this little series on the Upali Paripricha Sutra. All right.